Hey everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. Uh, so this is the, the lecture uh, notes, the, the lecture notes called Case Studies, and it starts out talking, once again, reviewing the uh, math for the one box model. In your book it's called the one box model. Engineered, engineers would call it a continuously stirred tank reactor, a CSTR. Uh, other people might call it a well-mixed reactor. Everybody has a different name for it. Uh, but it's basically just a box that is well mixed. And just to review the math really quickly, we have a mass balance. Uh, oops, sorry. We have a mass balance on our reactor. Uh, dm dt is equal to the inputs minus the outputs minus any reactions that are happening. Uh, and again, Dr. Ukrin loves this equation and will definitely ask you about this equation if you either have a master's exam or you have a qualifying exam for your PhD. Uh, sometimes it's more useful to do concentration instead of mass, and so we could divide everything through by volume if we wanted to. One of the assumptions that we make uh, is that the volume is constant, and if so, then the output is, and the only output is the flushing, so then the output is equal to Q, the flow rate, something like meters per, cubic meters per day, for example, times the concentration of your chemical, um, and so you could express the concentration as mass over volume. So Q over V has the units of a first, first order rate constant because Q is something like cubic meters per day and volume is cubic meters. So you divide one by the other and you get something like per day, which are the units of a first order rate constant. And so this is what we call K sub W, which is our flushing or dilution rate. And then the other assumption that I'm always gonna make in my class is that all reactions are first order because I can't handle the math. If they aren't first order, I freak out. So we're just not going to do that. As long as that's true, then each first order process has its little k, its, its uh, rate constant. And so we could sum those all up and call them a k total. And once we do that, we could rewrite our mass balance here as kw times m minus k tot times m. Uh, and then you could lump those together and rearrange this a little bit. And at steady state, again, at steady state, dm dt is equal to the big goose egg. And that's what we call the mass at time infinity, or the mass at steady state, is equal to the inputs divided by the sum of all of these different rate constants. So that's what we're going to use. And we might also calculate a time to steady state, which would be the natural log of 0.05, which is 3, divided by the sum of the rate constants. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do a couple of case studies. The first one is going to be PCB11 in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. You can guess who came up with this one. That, of course, would be me, because I love PCBs. My whole life is, is all about PCBs. Uh, and PCB11 is a particularly interesting compound. So first, let's just talk about the New York, New Jersey Harbor. This is a very, 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 very complex system. You know, I've worked in the Portland Harbor Superfund site. I've worked in the Delaware River. I'm working in the Spokane River. Um, and in comparison, those are really simple systems compared to the New York, New Jersey Harbor, but that's the one that's right outside our door. So we're over here somewhere uh, emitting crap into the Raritan River, which is flowing into Raritan Bay, which is part of this whole complex. So the freshwater inputs, mostly the big ones are the Raritan River, the Rahway River. One of these over here is the Elizabeth River. Here's the Passaic River, the Hackensack. Those are, you know, smaller. The big freshwater input is from the Hudson River coming down across along the, the, the west side of Manhattan into what we might call Upper New York Bay. Uh, and then lower down here is Lower New York Bay, Raritan Bay, Sandy Hook Bay, this whole area. So frequently we draw sort of an imaginary line uh, between the tip of Long Island and the tip of Sandy Hook, and we consider that to be the boundary between what is the harbor and what is not the harbor. So uh, those are the freshwater flows, and then there's some tidal flow uh, through the, th this is the East River, um, and I believe this is the Gowanus Canal, but I could be wrong. S and then there's some tidal flushing out to Long Island Sound, which is out over here. So, so this is all very complicated, you know, this is all tidal, water is going in both directions, up and down the East River, which is not a river, in and out of, of the, the New York Bay. And uh, it turns out, as in most of these highly urbanized systems, a big part of the total flow is flow of treated wastewater. There are some rivers where the flow of treated wastewater is like half of all the flow. So uh, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about the chemistry of, dis dis of drinking water disinfection 
and you're going to be disturbed to find that people withdraw their drinking water from the same rivers that they discharge their wastewater into. That happens very commonly. Uh, and then there are places where they explicitly take their wastewater and recycle it into drinking water, places like Southern California, uh, where they just don't have enough fresh water. So it's kind of upsetting that a lot of what, a lot of what you end up drinking is actually recycled wastewater. All right, so the total inflow of water to our system is about 2,000 cubic meters per second. That includes tidal stuff going back and forth. Total volume, about 5 times 10 to the, 10 to the ninth cubic meters. So it's about 5 cubic kilometers. So the flushing rate, Q over V, uh, you just divide the, the Q, the inflow, by the, the volume, and you get a flushing rate of about 0.035 per day. And so one way to think about that, nobody, it's hard to think in units of per day. So sometimes we just take one over that uh, and that gives us 21, 29 days. That is what we call the residence time or the characteristic time um, of water in the harbor. So somewhere around a month is the characteristic residence time of water in the month in, in the harbor. This is a, a typical uh, value but it can vary quite a bit. Certainly when you have a big storm with a lot of fresh water flows, they're flushing water rapidly out into the harbor, uh, and that could make your residence time much shorter than 29 days. Uh, and, and under drought conditions or summer low flow, when the fresh water flow coming into the harbor is on the low side, this could be much longer. The residence time could be much longer. So this is just a, 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 a generic number that applies sort of average across the year. So PCB11 is an interesting PCB congener because it's not produced intentionally, never was produced intentionally, but it comes from all of these um, pigments. The difference, in case you did not know, I did not until I started this, the difference between a pigment and a dye is that dyes are dissolved in the, the solvent and then applied to the material, and they, are, they saturate the material from the inside to the outside and all the way through whereas pigments are applied on the surface. So anyway, uh, diarylid yellows are a, a class of pigments that all have the same basic structure with different R groups on the sides here. And the different R groups give them slightly different colors, slightly different shading. Uh, but you notice that the interior here in the red box is a PCB molecule. And when you synthesize these diarylid pigments, you automatically you're going to get some of this PCB11 as an inadvertent byproduct. And when I talk to the pigment people, they tell me that there's no way around it, that it's just a fact. You're always going to get some, um, and that substituting other pigments for this diarylid yellows is just not feasible, at least not today, maybe someday. But right now, this is what we have, what we have to work with, and we're always going to have some PCB11. By the way, um, if you ever read the book Tom's River, which of course is about Tom's River, New Jersey, and about the cancer cluster there, it talks a lot about this chemistry, and it points out that uh, there's a reason why we added these chlorines. Uh, it used to be that those two chlorines were not on the molecule, and instead of having this thing, which is 3,3-dichlorobenzidine, you just had plain old benzidine. And uh, the reason that they added the chlorines is because benzidine is incredibly toxic, really, really bad, causes bladder cancer. So they added the chlorines, ironically, to make this molecule less toxic. Yay! Unintended consequences. So the unintended consequence of that is that we have all this PCB11 that's out here um, in the environment and not a whole lot we can do about it, although one of my areas of research is trying to figure out you know, what we could do about it. So uh, one of the things I did is I just went to my recycling bin and I measured the PCB11 concentration uh, in all of these materials that I took out of my recycling bin, you know, newspapers and, and yellow cereal boxes and my yellow plastic bag that I got from the grocery store. Uh, and then I also collected some paper samples from all over the world and I found PCB11 everywhere all the time in all of these different types of materials. So, it, and it gets out, you know, it gets out of these materials and gets into the water column. So properties of PCB11, the Henry's Law constants around 10 to the minus two dimensionless. Log KOW, log KOW around 5. We're going to assume it's unreactive. That's, that's a safe assumption in this case. And what happens is that there's the, the largest wastewater treatment plants, or well, they all vie to, to decide who's the largest. But I believe that the largest wastewater treatment plant in New Jersey is Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission, PVSC. 
and PDSC was receiving waste from companies that were manufacturing these pigments. And as a result, they had really high concentrations of PCB11 in their waste. So the load of PCB11 coming out of this one wastewater treatment plant into the harbor was around 100 kilograms per year. Now, my understanding is that the facility that was manufacturing these pigments moved that process overseas. My understanding is that they moved it to Europe, believe it or not. Uh, but regardless, I, I believe that this is no longer going on. But still, uh, back in the day, around 2000, the load was about 100 kilograms per year. So uh, we want to find out what's going on. You know, what is the steady state concentration of PCB11 in the harbor, um, considering that that's the load? So we're going to consider, because we've decided that our chemical is not reactive, we're going to consider just the physical processes. Flushing, of course, we always have to deal with flushing, just the water flushing out of the system and out to the Atlantic. We're going to think about volatilization, and we're going to think about settling with particles. So sedimentation, we know that we can assume that particles settle at a rate of about 0.7 meters per day. We've said that that's a pretty reasonable number for most systems. Um, the concentration of particles in the harbor, you know, varies considerably, but we're going to use an average value of about 10 milligrams per liter. A uh, fraction of organic carbon, 0.2, this is pretty typical for the harbor. And so we know that PCB11 will partition onto the organic carbon in the particles. This is important because only the fraction that is absorbed to those particles is settling. And it's also important because it's only the fraction that's not sorbed to particles that is volatilizing. So to do our calculation of the fraction that is bound to these particles, we need to know KOC. Uh, there's many different ways to get this. We could go on uh, EpiWin. We could use that LFZ, LSCR, UF, UFZ LSCR uh, website. There's a lot of different ways we could do this. Um, what I did here is I just used this equation from the book, which was specific for PCBs that let you calculate log KOC from log KOW. And so I plugged in the 5.3 for the KOW value, and I got a log KOC of about 4.09. So that means KOC is about 12,000. Okay, so 10 to the 4.09 is about 12,000. So, uh, First thing we got to do is figure out our, our rate constant for settling of particles. Uh, we had a, a rate, a velocity here of 0.7 meters per day, but I want to convert it into a rate constant, and I do that by dividing by the depth of the harbor, which is about 0.5 meters. Again, you know, we're making a lot of assumptions here. One of those assumptions is that it's a, you know, the depth is the same everywhere, which of course it's not, but that's what we're going to assume. So 0.7 meters per day divided by 5 meters gives you 0.14 per day as your rate constant for settling of, of particles. So that uh, is much faster than the flushing, which we said was 0.035 per day. Okay, but that's just the settling of the particles. We have to consider that not all of the chemical is absorbed to the particles. So... <coughs> Uh, in order to get this to work out, our dm dt is the total mass. This m, everywhere you see m here, is the total mass of our chemical in our system. And we haven't specifically defined what our system is, but if you remember from the lecture on the one box models, I said to you, usually your system is the water. And wherever the water stops is where your system stops. So in other words, the, the sediment bed is not part of the system, but the water above the sediment is part of the system. So the mass is all of the chemical that is floating around in the water. Some of that mass is absorbed to particles, some of that mass is freely dissolved, some of that mass could be dissolved to, absorbed to dissolved organic carbon. Um, so there's a lot that's going on here, but what we have to do then is we have to recognize that this mass, uh, we have to convert the, the concentration that's dissolved to the total mass. And so we need to know the fraction of our chemical that is absorbed. And we, then we multiply our rate constant for settling of particles by the fraction that is absorbed, and that gives us our rate constant for sedimentation of our chemical. So we have to figure out how much of the chemical is absorbed to the particles. We use this familiar equation. Um, so the fraction that's 
in the we're using FW here, but really we should probably be using FD for dissolved is 1 over 1 plus the ratio of solids to water times KOC times FOC. So again, we had 10 milligrams per liter of solids, which we convert to kilograms per liter, so that when we multiply by KOC, which is in liters per kilogram, the units will all cancel. And then here's our FOC value, and we get a fraction that's dissolved as 0.976. So for this chemical that had a log KOC value of, of around 4, most of the chemical is actually dissolved. Not that much is on the particles. So only about 2.5% is on the particles. So we have to multiply our settling velocity by this 0.024. So now, instead of our settling velocity being 0.14 per day, now it's gone all the way down to 0.0023 per day, which is actually much slower than the flushing rate. So, it, you know, if we, if we forget to account for the fraction that's absorbed to the particles, uh, we can really get it wrong in terms of what's, what's settling out of the water column. Then we deal with volatilization. You remember that we can write our volatilization rate like this, but usually what we do is we just ignore what's dissolving back in from the atmosphere and just only think about what's volatilizing out. And then we do the same kind of parlor trick that we did for settling where we divide the rate, the, the, the coefficient, the, the velocity term for settling, we divide it by the depth. So, um, our VAW value is about a meter per day. I'm not going to go through how we derive that. Just trust me on that one. Uh, by the way, this a meter per day is, is the mass transfer coefficient for volatilization that they chose for all PCBs everywhere all the time in the CARP model, uh, which is a crappy way to parameterize volatilization, especially when volatilization is the most important loss process. But don't get me started. Um, yeah, there are issues. The CARP, the CARP model is not perfect. Anyway, so our mass tra transfer coefficient is 1 meter per day, our depth is 5 meters, divide, and you get 0.2 per day as your volatilization rate. But again, this, is, this rate only applies to the fraction of the chemical that is truly dissolved. And we already calculated that that fraction is 97.6% of the total. So we multiply 97.6% by 0.2 per day, and we get a volatilization rate constant of 0.195 per day, pretty close to 0.2 per day. So let's put it all together. Um, the, uh, we know that the inputs are about 100 kilograms per year, so I'm going to convert that into days so that our units are all the same. So that's 0.27 kilograms per day. Our flushing rate was 0.35 per day, which gave us a, uh, a characteristic time of about a month. And then if I do the, the, the math, uh, 1 divided by 0.0023, means that our characteristic time for sedimentation is 434, 434 days. So that's quite a slow process. But then if I do 1 divided by 0 0.195, our characteristic time for volatilization is about 5 days. So this is a by far the fastest process um, responsible for removing most of the mass from the system. So our mass at steady state, if we use this equation, our mass at steady state comes out to be 0.74 kilograms. Divide that by the total volume of the system, and you get 150 picograms per liter. Now, the water quality standard for the sum of all PCBs is 64 picograms per liter. So in other words, PCB11 alone is exceeding the water quality standard for the sum of all PCBs under those conditions when you were emitted, uh, emitting 100 kilograms of your chemical per year. Now you can see how um, I've done this math for PCB11, but the water quality standard is for the sum of all PCBs, right? And uh, as, PCB, as PCBs go, PCB11 is small, it only has two chlorines, which means it has a high Henry's Law constant and a relatively low log KOW relative to the other PCBs. So the other PCBs are not going to volatilize as much, but they will settle more with particles. So you have to do the calculations to figure out how much PCBs you can expel or, or discharge into the harbor and still meet this water quality standard of 64 picograms per liter. 
um, and it would depend on the mixture of the PCBs that are out there. How many of them have two chlorines versus how many have three and how many have four. Uh, and all those calculations are what go into calculating the total maximum daily load of PCBs for the harbor. The harbor at this moment does not have a promulgated TMDL. Uh, why not is a long, complicated story that I think is mostly political. Uh, they have all the data to do it. They've just decided not to do it. But that's the story of PCB 11 in the harbor. Let's think for a moment about all the caveats here. Uh, there's a lot of limitations to this model. The first of all, the assumption of the well-mixed box model is that it's well-mixed. And the idea that the harbor is well-mixed is pretty far-fetched. It's got all these little embayments and side channels and things, and it's, it's probably not very well-mixed. So that's a big assumption that could well be wrong. We're assuming no degradation. I think that that's actually a pretty good assumption for PCB 11. Um, it's possible that PCB 11 could be degraded aerobically. I, I'm not I'm, I'm skeptical, but, but uh, some people like to argue that. Uh, the other thing is that we have dramatically oversimplified the processes, especially air water exchange, because we did not take into account wind speed. We just said it's wind speed. We, we take into account, um, we don't take this into account. We just assume that the mass transfer coefficient is one meter per day everywhere all the time. That's ridiculous. Um, also, we've ignored the fact that there could be lots of other inputs, and in fact, I'm sure that there are other inputs of PCB11 to this system, stormwater runoff and other, way, other treated discharges and things like that. So um, it's always important to go back and consider the limitations of your model and ask how, how good this model really is for your system. Um, and there's a famous quote, I don't remember who said this, but I know Chris Eucherin likes to repeat it all the time, which is that all models are wrong, right? They're all wrong. But some of them, some, are useful. And this, I think, is a very useful model. It's telling us that we got a problem with PCB11 in the harbor. Um, and yes, some of these assumptions are not correct, but it, it's roughly speaking giving us uh, a heads up that PCB11 alone could be exceeding the water quality standard. And in fact, it turns out that if you, if you actually go measure the, co the concentrations of PCB11, back around 2000 when they were discharging 100 kilograms per liter to the harbor, excuse me, 100 kilograms per year to the harbor, um, it does turn out that the concentration of PCB11 is not that far off. It's around, it's somewhere around 100 kilograms, 100 picograms per liter. So this box model actually did a pretty good job. Let's consider another example. This is from Schwarzenbach's textbook, page 1000, 1,056, excuse me. Uh, yeah, it's a long textbook. Uh, this is vinyl acetate discharge into a pond. So here's your vinyl acetate molecule. This is what it looks like. Uh, no acid base chemistry for us to worry about. Uh, definitely hydrogen bond accepting, but not hydrogen bond donating. So fairly soluble, um, small molecule, fast diffusivity, likely to volatilize relatively readily. So an industry has, a vinyl, has vinyl acetate in its process waste, and it's releasing 100 grams per day of vinyl acetate to our pond. The measured concentration of this chemical in the water comes out to be 10 milligrams per liter. And you, so you've done all these measurements. Let's say you work for the local water utility, and you're using this water for this pond for drinking water, so you want to make sure it's safe. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, given that I know this one place is discharging 100 grams per day, and I know my concentration is around 10 milligrams per liter, is, does it make sense that this industry is the only source of that vinyl acetate? Or are there other sources? You need to know this, because if this industry is the only source, then you can go deal with them. But if it turns out there's lots of other sources, then you need to deal with those other sources first. And it would be helpful to know which source is bigger this specific industry that you're aware of or some other unknown source. Uh, and then the other question is, if you could get this industry to just turn off its, its discharge of vinyl acetate, how long would it take the pond to recover? So we have some uh, information about our pond, our volume, our surface area, our water through flow, our water temperature, uh, and our pH. And so we also have um, information about the vinyl acetate. And what's different here now is that we're not going to assume that there's no reactions. We do have reactions. Vinyl acetate hydrolyzes. So if we go back, we can see that the attack of the nucleophile would be right here to that carbon. Uh, and then this thing would be the leaving group. So vinyl acetate does hydrolyze. 
Uh, it has a, a an acid catalyzed rate constant Ka of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. It's got a K neutral of 1.1 times 10 to the minus 7. And notice that the neutral has the units of a first order rate constant, whereas the acid catalyzed has units of a second order rate constant. And KB also has units of a second order rate constant because that for KB, the nucleophile is hydroxide. Our VAW is given at 0.45 meters per day. Log KOW, 0.73. Henry's law constant given about 52 pascal meter cubed per mole. So the neutral hydrolysis, we don't have to worry about converting units. It's already in the correct units. Or it's, I mean, it's, we don't have to worry about correct, correcting for the molarity of the, the reactant. It's already in pseudo first order units. So I'm just going to convert the units from one over second to one over days. Um, and then the tau, one over this number, is about 73 days. So it just gives you a rough idea. You know, what are we talking about with this pod? It's got a turnover time or a characteristic time of about 73 days. Um, Ka is, you know, 0.00014, one over molar second. Uh, and at pH 7, the acid, you know, that, that, we're, that we're interested in is the protons. So at a pH of 7, the protons have 10 to the minus 4, excuse me, 10 to the minus 7 molar concentration. So you multiply this by 10 to the minus 7, and you get something times 10 to the minus 11, which is really, really, really slow and too slow to matter. So we can ignore this. Um, and then the Kb is about 10 per molar second, and at pH 7, you have to, again, multiply by that by the concentration of hydroxide, which is 10 to the minus 7. So 10 times 10 to the minus 7 is 10 to the minus 6, uh, and that's in 1 over seconds. If we convert it to days and calculate a characteristic time, the characteristic time is about 8 days. So Kb uh, is, is looking pretty good as the most important loss process for our chemical. Physical processes, okay, with a flushing rate of the pond, we divide Q over V and we get 0.1 per day, 0.01 per day. So one over this is 100 days. So our tau, our characteristic time of water retention in the pond is about 100 days. Uh, the volatilization rate, we, we're given a mass transfer coefficient of 0.45 meters per day. We divide that by the depth of the pond, which is 5 meters. And that gives us 0.09 per day which is a characteristic time of about eight days. So the, the base catalyzed hydrolysis and the volatilization are both giving us characteristic times of about eight days, uh, which means that th these are the, by far the two biggest loss processes. Now we have to multiply this by the fraction that's dissolved, but this is a compound with a log KOW in here somewhere, log KOW of point 73. That's log KOW is 0.73. So that's tiny. I mean, we already saw that for PCB11, which had a log KOW of around 5, it was 97 point some percent in the dissolve phase. And so we don't even need to do the math here. You can trust me on this, that this chemical is virtually 100% dissolved. And what that also means is that the chemical is virtually not at all in the sediment. So the sedimentation is unimportant and we can ignore that part. Okay, so here's our CSDR model. Again, the mass at time infinity, or at steady state, is equal to the inputs divided by the sum of the rate constants. So our input is 100 grams per day. We've got our, our um, volatilization, and we've got our base catalyzed reactions, and we've got our um, flushing rate. So you put all that together in the denominator, and you get a steady state mass of 900 grams divide that by the, the size, the volume of the pond, and you get 0.09 grams per cubic meter, which is 0.09 milligrams per liter. And the measured concentration was 10 milligrams per liter. So this very simple box model has demonstrated to you that that one industry that's emitting 100 grams per day can't possibly be the only source of vinyl acetate to this pond. There must be something else because you're off by you know two orders of magnitude. If you're off by a factor of two, eh, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the model. I wouldn't worry about it. But here we're off by two orders of magnitude. The difference between about 0.1 milligrams per liter and 10 milligrams per liter is the difference of 100 or two orders of magnitude. So there has to be another source of vinyl acetate. So before you go to that industry and say, hey, you guys need to clean up your act, you have to stop 
and say, hmm, what are the other sources of vinyl acetates in the pond? How big is that other source? Well, we could just turn our equation around and instead of calculating the mass at steady state, we could say we know the mass at steady state. We know it's 10 milligrams per liter, roughly. And so we could calculate I, the input. Turns out that the input would have to be around 200 kilograms, uh, and this should be per day, right? Because um, we have, have to get our units right. So about 200 kilograms per day. So it's, it's a pretty big source. And then the time to steady state is about, again, that's the natural log of 0.05, which is 3, divided by the sum of the rate constants, gives us a time, of st time to steady state of 27 days. So if, let's say, for example, that we are using this pond for drinking water, uh, and we need to get the concentration down to some low level, we know that if we could stop all emis emissions of vinyl acetate to the pond, we would still have to wait a month before we could start to use the pond as our drinking water source. So those are some examples of how you can calculate mass balances and uh, one box models and use them to understand natural systems. I just want to point out that this is like real. I'm not making this stuff up. We actually do this. We use the one box model to do uh, all kinds of TMDLs and, and water quality parameterization and, and trying to figure out how to deal with impairments. We use these one box models all the time. Now we don't do a one box model of the entire harbor. What we would do is divide the harbor up into hundreds of little one box models, but they're all connected where the output of one box is the input to the next box. Uh, and that is categorized and formalized in water quality models that you can download from the web. EPA has their own models. You can download them from EPA's website and then you customize them for your specific system. That's what they did in the Delaware, that's what they did in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, that's, that's what they do. And I want to point out, this is from the EPA's website, this is causes of impairment under the Clean Water Act, and the number one thing is pathogens, and then mercury, metals, nutrients, dissolved oxygen, sediments, but the first organic chemical that you get to that's on this list is PCBs, um, then you get to pesticides, most of that is DDT, and here you have dioxins. So these are main major sources of impairment to U.S. waterways. And so the, the type of stuff we're learning about how to use one box models to, to predict their fate is completely applicable uh, to these chemicals in real systems. Uh, the Delaware River, as I said, is one system where they've used this approach, this box model approach, to calculate a TMDL. It's an interesting story. Uh, the Delaware is a historically industrialized estuary including the city of Philadelphia, but also Camden, Trenton, Wilmington, Delaware. So some, some major cities with a lot of um, heavy industry refineries. If you've ever driven through Philadelphia on I-95, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's no smoking gun in the Delaware. There's no clear source of PCBs. Uh, it's just uh, coming in a little bit in dribs and drabs everywhere. And I think it was 2005, there was a huge oil spill um, in the Delaware River. And uh, that's what it looked like for a while. It was awesome. And of course, that's because of these refineries in the city. Somebody was um, transporting heavy fuel oil uh, into the city and, and apparently hit some underwater obstacle and ripped a hole in their boat and, and uh, spewed oil all over the river. So, you know, it's got issues. So the um, tidal Delaware River has a total ma total maximum daily load, a TMDL for PCBs. It was established in 2003, and it was done under a court order because um, the Delaware River Basin Commission, the states, the EPA, all the, all the people who are responsible for the river got sued uh, by, I believe it was the American Littoral Society and somebody else, I forget who the other party was, so they sued back in the 90s, and the, the, the judge settled the lawsuit in 1996 and said that the Delaware River Basin Commission had seven years to come up with a TMDL. And that's how long it took. And they barely, barely, barely got it done in time. In fact, they, I would argue that they really didn't get it done in time. They kind of did a back-of-the-envelope TMDL for 2003, and then they refined it later. So the uh, current water quality standard for PCBs in 
surface water is a 64 picograms per liter. That's the federal level. States are allowed to set their own levels. And in fact, the Delaware, the DRBC, the Delaware River Basin Commission, they did set their own level, which was lower. I think it was somewhere around 10 picograms per liter. Um, but as long as you can justify it, you're allowed to calculate a different water quality standard. Um, funny story, in the Houston Ship Canal, which you know is in Houston, Texas, they calculated a water quality standard of 885 picograms per liter. Uh, so an order of magnitude greater than the federal standard, and the feds let them get away with it. And as a result, there's no problem with PCBs in the Houston Ship Canal as long as you don't mind 885 picograms per liter of PCBs. Um, so for people, the main route of exposure to PCBs is eating contaminated fish. So where do you come up with this water quality standard? Well, you calculate how much fish people eat and how much PCBs you can ingest without causing cancer. And then you use those numbers to back out what concentration of PCBs you can have in the water column that will keep the concentration of the fish low enough that you won't give cancer to humans.